Well, greetings and welcome to The Hidden Library. This is a brand new podcast and I am really excited to be bringing this to you. Reading is a much loved pastime of mine that I have loved since I was a child and I still love to read to this day, whether I am reading history, whether I'm reading fantasy, fiction, nonfiction, or even a little bit of gothic horror. I love it all. As a writer of stories and musician myself, I tend to get a lot of my inspiration from some of the books I read and what is within my own library. And that is much of what will be discussed in this podcast, what I am reading and what I think of it, my thoughts on the book itself. For those of you that might not be familiar with me, I will introduce myself. My name is Tiffany Apan, and I am a musician, a singer, songwriter. I have also written fantasy fiction. I really adore Celtic themes, historical themes. I have been involved in the living history world for about six years now. I very much enjoy it. My main focus has been uh, mid-18th century, about French and Indian or Seven Years' War, up into about Revolutionary War. But I have also been involved in reenacting some Regency era. I am taking interest in the War of 1812. And I have also dabbled a little bit in Victorian and Edwardian or early 20th century. Um, However, a lot of my research uh, for my new album, which is inspired by themes from uh, and events, of course, from Tudor England and then Plantagenet England, Uh, which was the dynasty prior to the Tudors. I have been just reading up a storm and just researching up a storm. And, um, And with... All of that, I have also taken an interest, uh, or I should say retaken an interest, because I've always had an interest in uh, medieval history, but um, my interest has grown uh, in that area again. And I plan to actually uh, look into some medieval living history, because like I said, especially researching Plantagenet England, that's just been... um, Um, just for my album, that has been just a huge just influence on me right now as I am reading much on that particular dynasty along with the Tudors. If you are interested in checking out some of my music work as well as some of my stories, you can check out my website, Tiffany com and that should lead you to several areas where you can take in some of my work and see exactly oh what I do. This podcast will cover a nice variety of books, including historical books, including some historical drama, historical fiction, historical fantasy, straight up fantasy and even the occasional good old-fashioned gothic horror. And now, without further ado, here is the first book being discussed in the Hidden Library podcast, episode one. Now, in the variety of roles that I have portrayed, in the living history and reenactment world. Most of them are ladies, but I am going to the other side and will be portraying a gentleman, a French soldier to be exact, in the French army during the time of the French and Indian War, which I am really, really excited about. It's a new challenge for me. Now, as far as the ladies that I have portrayed, I have portrayed ladies from the highest class of society. I have portrayed the camp followers. I have portrayed 
worker women on the frontier, you name it, I've pretty much done it, uh, particularly in the 18th century. I have also uh, been involved in the early music world. I am involved in an early music tavern group, Wayward Companions, and I have had to wear period clothing while performing with them, and it is great fun. But in doing all of this, I have definitely worn my share of stays or corsets as many people would know them today. Now, as somebody who walks around quite frequently in period clothing, I have been asked a very, very wide array of questions, and I'm sure many who are in the living history and reenactment world can relate. Of course, you get the old, aren't you hot in that, especially on a hot summer's day when we're having to wear period clothing. And now, of course, the answer to that question very much depends on the person wearing the clothing. There are those of us that actually find the clothing to be quite comfortable, others not so much. However, as a lady, one question that I have gotten asked very frequently, as actually several questions that I have gotten asked very, very frequently, involves me wearing a corset or stays as they are very often called in the 18th century clothing world. Now as somebody who has spent much time debunking historical myths, I have actually had to debunk many, many myths involving corsets and stays. Uh, number one, 18th century stays and the Victorian era corsets are two completely different things. And I will get into that a little bit later. However, the very first book that I am going to be discussing in this first episode is Sarah A. Crisman's Victorian Secrets, What a Corset Taught Me About the Past, the Present, and Myself. Now, I don't think it's really any secret that the reputation of the corset is not a great one, at least not for the most part. Those of us that do wear them on a regular basis, we have our own perspective and views on them. We've all done our own research on them. And I am always very, very fascinated to get the perspective of others, of other women within the living history and reenactment world who also wear them on a very frequent basis. Different perspectives are always good. I came across Sarah Crisman's book, Victorian Secrets, when I was doing research for a clothing demonstration that I was doing at a living history site. And of course, I wanted to cover stays and corsets because that was a great part of a woman's undergarments for quite some time. I will be discussing a little bit on my own experience with wearing corsets and stays and my own thoughts on them. However, first I will be discussing Sarah A. Crisman's experience that she demonstrates in her book. I did find her own journey to be a very fascinating one, and I very much enjoyed reading about it. So now, without further ado, here is Sarah A. Crisman's Victorian Secrets, What a Course It Taught Me About the Past, Present, and Myself. Victorian Secrets, What a Course It Taught Me About the Past, Present, and Myself, is a true story, according to the book jacket, a true story about discovering positive selfhood from a woman who moved beyond stereotypes to explore the world of corsetry firsthand. On Sarah Crisman's 29th birthday, her husband presented her with a corset as a present. 
She found the design and the material itself to be quite beautiful and very breathtaking. And while she loved the Victorian era, grew up loving it all of her life, she had always told her husband that if anything, never buy her a corset. She had heard the many stories about how they restricted a woman's movement and just the woman's body and female form in general, and just how terrible they had been, and she wanted nothing to do with it. Now, I do find this part of the book pretty fascinating as Sarah is wearing the corset for the first time and she is very conflicted, has all these different conflicting thoughts going through her mind. On the one hand, she's feeling quite beautiful in the corset, but on the other hand, she still has thoughts of the restrictive history going through her head. course in her mind she did not want to like or even remotely enjoy the corset however the more she wore it the more enjoyable she actually found having the garment on and from that point on she actually started to develop a curiosity for this undergarment and this piece of clothing that women wore so often for centuries and in the process, she started implementing it into her everyday life. This included, and she did not have a car, so this included riding her, wearing the corset while riding her bike everywhere, and even wearing it to her martial arts classes. Every morning, her husband Gabriel would lace her up into her corset and she would go about her day. And as she wore the corset, the more she started to really find herself developing an inner confidence. She started to change from the inside as well as the outside, starting to wear clothing that she not only surprisingly felt more like herself in, but clothing that she also felt complemented her newfound shape. In the book, Chrisman describes herself as having previously, prior to receiving the corset, having using clothing as a means to hide herself in, to make herself invisible. And with the beginning of wearing this, just this simple undergarment from the past, she started to transform how she viewed herself and her own body image. After a year of wearing a corset on a daily basis, her waist had actually shrunk from 32 inches to 22 inches. And this was due to the fact that one, she was doing a little bit of waist training while she was wearing the corset. And two, her diet had actually started to change as she proceeded on with her personal journey and evolution. And also after a year of wearing the corset, she started to experience fewer migraines, believe it or not. Her posture had improved and she had also successfully transformed her body dress and her lifestyle into those of a Victorian woman. And of course, everybody was asking her about it and she would get questions from people coming to her off the streets asking her about basically what she was wearing. She had also started to develop her research further into the history of the corset, a very, very interesting history as well. She had also started to expand her knowledge on clothing of the Victorian era in general. And she and her husband were very often invited to history sites to give their own presentations and present their displays. Now, I loved this book. I really, really enjoyed reading about Sarah Crisman's journey, if you will, to pretty much finding herself. There's really no other way to put that. And she herself came out of her shell and really asserted herself and came forward and started to live the life that she wanted to live. And all by starting out wearing a 
piece of clothing from the past. And not only that, but an undergarment that is typically not seen in the best light. And I do think that this book is a really, really good example of how we all have our own individual journeys. And it is really only for us to travel. Now, how did the public react to Sarah Chrisman and her newfound style, especially when she started to really lean forward into really presenting herself as a Victorian lady? Well, of course, the reviews were mixed and she got some really, really positive compliments as well as some not so positive remarks from people. She had several people curious about her style and asking her some pretty interesting questions on why she chose to dress the way she did, which she gladly answered. And she had some really, really nice and fun conversations with some people in explaining why she chose the Victorian style of dress and sharing some of her knowledge and uh, just overall experience in wearing corsets and the Victorian style women's dress. And then there were others that were actually not only objectifying, not only objecting to her style of clothing, but downright degrading, just coming up to her and telling her about how terrible it was that she was dressing the way she was and how she was setting women back and how just really, really just, I will say almost being very intolerant to how she was choosing to express herself. She highlights some of these conversations and confrontations in chapter 14, which is titled Objections, and chapter 15, which is also titled Votes for Women. In fact, it is in chapter 15 that she actually has a very nice conversation with the woman on a bus as uh, Chrisman is on her way to a women's suffrage tea. And she makes a quote to uh, this woman who asks her about where she's going and actually gets quite excited when Chrisman informs her that she's going to a tea that is going to be celebrating the women's suffrage. And she asks Sarah Chrisman if she's a women's studies major and Chrisman says no. Uh, however, she is quite fascinated with that part of history and she gives her own thoughts and views on the suffrage movement. In fact, there is one very interesting quote that she makes to this woman and she reflects this in the book and the quote goes, in my own mind, I reflected that part of why I enjoy wearing a corset so much is that it is an accentuation of this difference. A woman is not an inferior man, so why should she dress like one? Skirts are far superior to trousers for many needs of the female form, especially when paired with pantalettes. I am very proud to be a woman and I had learned to enjoy flaunting that pride. My seat partner was intrigued and said that I had given her a lot to think about. With the bus rapidly reaching her stop, though she asked if she might change the subject to a far less weighty matter to satisfy a curiosity before she departed, after my assurance that this would be perfectly fine, she asked, is it accurate for you to be wearing earrings? Did they really have pierced ears back then? I laughed. I had once asked my mother a nearly identical question when watching the medieval fantasy, The Princess Bride. I had been about seven years old at the time though. Oh yes, I reached up, feeling an earring to remind myself which ones I was actually wearing. Actually, these are quite a bit older than the dress. These are from about the 1860s or so, and the dress is more like 1905. 
People have been wearing earrings since, oh, about the time they figured out they could poke holes through their ears with sharp things. We both laughed and I went on. There's a really famous painting that's actually called Girl with the Pearl Earring, and that was done a few hundred years before this dress. She had still seemed dubious up until this point, but that bit of information clinched the earring question for her. Oh yeah, she exclaimed, I saw that movie. I usually cringe at citations of Hollywood portrayals as though they are actual facts, but I let this one slide given that it is supposed to prove my point, and also that it was based on a book which was inspired by the painting in question. So that's a little excerpt from the book Victorian Secrets by Sarah Crisman. Now, whether you agree with her observation and the way she views women's clothing or not. It definitely, I believe that excerpt gives you a little bit of an insight as to where she was coming from on her own journey in deciding to wear Victorian era clothing on a regular basis and how it shaped her into the person that she became once she started to make that journey herself. Now, as I said in the beginning of this episode, I will be weighing in on my own experience with wearing corsets and stays, as well as period clothing. And I also, I, there are some things in uh, Sarah Crisman's book that I could definitely relate to and other things, you know, I didn't quite agree with, but you know, but that's what's so great about this. Everybody has their own unique experience and their own unique take on how things work for them. And I really, really, as I said before, enjoyed reading about Sarah Crisman's journey and how she pretty much found herself just by starting to wear a corset and then it evolving into wearing shoes that were very similar to a Victorian woman. And then it evolved into her wearing clothing that was pretty similar, but still modern clothing. And then wearing just full on Victorian clothing. And it, I also found it very fascinating that a lot of her Victorian clothing were actually originals. They were in fact antiques and she was able to restore some of them and wear them to events, functions, and sometimes even out in her everyday life. Now, my own experience in wearing period undergarments, including corsets and stays, as well as the outer clothing, has overall been very positive. Of course, sometimes being at a living history reenactment event in the middle of July when it's really hot and I'm wearing period clothing, it's not always very pleasant. However, I've also come to the conclusion that I wouldn't be any more hot wearing my regular 21st century clothing than I was, than I would be in period clothing. Either way, you are, if it's mid July, it doesn't really matter what you're wearing, you are going to be hot. And that's just, that's just been my experience. And also a lot of 18th century clothing is meant to breathe very well, especially if you are wearing linen. Now, some people might still say that they're quite hot wearing linen and others say, yes, it is cool. They get good air circulation, air flow through their clothing. Everybody's different because we're all going to be having different physiological makeups and therefore we are going to respond to different types of materials, different clothings differently. And fortunately, there are a lot of cool little tips and tricks and a lot of nice information out there on how to stay cool at a living history and reenactment event, which I will definitely be partaking in, especially as I delve deeper into my soldier's persona and I will be wearing wool uniforms in basically the middle of July. <laughs> 
The thing about corsets is, and a lot of costuming experts, especially those that specialize in historical clothing, will tell you is that oftentimes if your corset is uncomfortable, you feel like you can't breathe or anything of that nature, or you feel like you can't move because you should be able to move freely in yours. Either it could be one of two things. It's either ill-fitted or you just haven't worn it enough for it to be able to mold to your body. And a lot of the times, if your corset or stays, if you do 18th century reenactment, if they are tailored for you specifically and your specific body shape, not just your general measurements, because even if you have the same measurements as one person, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have the exact same body shape. Um, I've run into people who they have the same measurements as I do, but they have maybe a longer torso or a shorter torso or, you know, something about maybe their rib cage is a bit wider or smaller. You know, you, it's, you can't just go by basic general measurements when you are making a corset for yourself. You have to take in to consideration all of your dimensions. And from there, you will fashion the corset or have the person who is making it for you take your exact measurements exact, <laughs> take your body composite, you know, everything into consideration and fashion that corset for you. And that is how corsets were typically made for women hundreds of years ago. In fact, I do know a woman who, when she got her first pair of Regency era stays and Regency era, for those that don't know, Regency era, goes from about the very, very late 18th century, 1790s, up into the year 1820, okay? So that's the Regency era. And the reason why it's called the Regency era is because King George IV, after King George III died, he ascended the throne and was regent for that time. And Regency era, also, if you're familiar with Jane Austen, if you've ever seen a Jane Austen movie, that is, the Regency era style. But she had gotten her first pair of Regency era stays, this woman I know, and she couldn't move her arms, okay? And she couldn't lift her arms at all while wearing these. And I, I and a couple other women told her it shouldn't be like that, but because she had heard all of the myths and rumors that surround corsets and stays because she had heard those very, very just kind of, you know, basically horror stories. She assumed that, well, that was the way it was supposed to be. And it took myself and a couple other women who, you know, we, we sew, we, we make um, these historical clothing and we, you know, we definitely, we, we do our research and we have done research, especially into corsets and how they are supposed to fit. We told her that, I, and I told her, I know I did, and I know a couple of these other women did as well, told her that, you know, it shouldn't be like that. You should actually be able to move pretty freely in your stays. And she, she was astonished. So we helped her make a very at one of our sewing circles and you know one of the other women were you know she was definitely helping assisting her and really helping her with making a very very nice pair of stays that would fit her that would mold to her measurements very nicely and she did it successfully and she was so surprised when she tried on those stays that were tailor-made for her she was so astonished with how comfortable it really was. And while I'm, I'm happy that she found a pair of, you know, she, well, didn't find, but had a pair of stays made for her that ended up working for her, that ended up being what she needed and, and what she could wear comfortably to events. I was also very troubled by the fact that she didn't even think to question 
her first pair of stays. She didn't even think to question, why can't I move my arms <laughs> in, the, in these pairs of stays? And it was all because of those common misconceptions that surround corsets that are perpetuated by so many things in our culture, including Hollywood. And I know Sarah Crisman in her book, she airs a lot of grievances with people that take Hollywood films as basically as accurate historical research and fact. And while I'm not saying that Hollywood historical films, because I definitely do enjoy some of them. In fact, I enjoy a lot of them if I'm being perfectly honest, but we also have to take into consideration is that very often, even though yes, they definitely do their share of historical research, they also take a lot of creative liberties and they are also going for sensationalism and they will put out there whatever they think might sell. In her book, Victorian Secrets, Sarah Crisman also gets into debunking some of the myths. And of course, I love a good historical myth debunking, but she gets into really d diving deep into a lot of the myths surrounding corsets and a lot of period clothing in general. And she brings to light her own research and her own findings and also just historical documents, catalogs of the era and just different things that explain where a lot of these myths came from and also dispelling just so many of these inaccuracies. One interesting thing that Crisman brings up in her book is the rumors of how corsets broke women's bones, meaning their ribs. Well, in her findings, and she did delve into a lot of records from tailors and people that fixed corsets on a regular basis. That's how they made their living. She found documents that, you know, basically imply that the broken bones meant the breaking of the boning in the corset and not necessarily human bones. Now, of course, not to say that there weren't women that went to extremes and might've actually done harm to themselves in the process. But for the most part, women wore their corsets very, very sensibly. They were used not only as shapewear, but also for many, especially when you're talking about 18th century stays, which was pre-Victorian, uh, you're talking about these 18th century stays, they were also meant for to be used as a back support, especially if you were a working woman. Uh, me personally, when I am doing a demonstration that involves me, say, having to lift something heavy, one thing that I, I do, and with being in the fitness industry, I definitely know to bend from my knees and not from my lower back. However, when you are in a corset, you're pretty much, forced to pick things up the correct way and not bend from your waist because one of the few movements that you can't you don't really have a whole lot of freedom to do while wearing a corset or a pair of stays is bending forward she also gets into in her book how the women suffragists also favored their corsets and several of them actually denounced some of the non-corseted fashions that were attempting to emerge at the time as very clownish. Now, Crisman has a wonderful bibliography of resources that she had used to research for her book. It's not just her insights. She also, like I said, gets into a lot of the history of corsets and clothing. Um, but one book that she does cite, and I do very highly recommend if you're interested in learning more about this subject, and I might actually cover this book on a future episode of The Hidden Library, is Valerie Steele's The Corset, A Cultural History. And of course, she also uh, cites some original sources, original documents, from 
from the time period, uh, particularly the Victorian era. And there's also some websites that she cites as well. Um, Long Island Stay Lace Association, uh, Corset Heaven, uh, Lucy's Corsetry, Movie Mistakes. <laughs> this is a big one. Um, also, Two Nerdy History Girls. I also very much enjoy their blog, Timeless Trends, Corset Designs. And that's only to name a few. Like I said, she has a whole long bibliography of sources at the end of the book. And I am actually quite glad that she wrote, you know, she took the time to write Victorian Secrets. And Chrisman also has written other books on living as a Victorian woman in the modern era. And she also has written her share of some historical fiction, which I really would love to check out. And I am glad that she wrote this book and Valerie Steele also has written her book on corsets and the cultural history behind them because I do think that a lot of the misinformation out there, like I said, I understand the points that people are trying to make and I might even agree with some of the points. However, when you are too much dwelling on just trying to make a statement and not wanting to get the facts, okay? I think it does a lot more harm than good. And I think of the, you know, my, you know, the friend of mine who was wearing an ill-fitted corset for quite some time, you know, like I said, she couldn't move her arms, at, like really couldn't raise her arms at all. And she thought that was normal. And as I said, I do, what I find very alarming about that is that somebody actually could be wearing a corset that is very ill-fitted and might not be really benefiting them at all. In fact, it might actually be harming them and they won't even think to question it because, well, they'll think it's normal thanks to a lot of the myths out there. And this is why I do get so passionate about dispelling not only this myth, but also a lot of other historical myths in other subjects, which I will be uh, getting into uh, more such books on dispelling historical myths in future podcasts. But for the time being, I bring you to the end of the very first episode of the Hidden Library podcast. And again, this was Sarah A. Crisman, Victorian Secrets, What a Corset Taught Me About the Past, Present, and Myself. You can buy the book on Amazon, and I'm sure you can also definitely support your local bookstores by asking them to order it for you um, if they don't have it in stock. So definitely, I recommend reading this, and what I enjoy is the fresh perspective that she gives on corsets and her own experience and evolution through wearing one, as well as wearing Victorian era women's clothing on a regular basis and how it came to really, really just shape her into the person that she has become. It helped her build confidence. It even helped her with some physical issues that she was having. And another person to check out, um, just a little side note, to check out on that particular aspect of wearing a corset, which is, like I said, helping with some physical issues is uh, Bernadette Banner. She has a nice little series on corsets and actually how wearing one helped her scoliosis because that was another purpose for um, corsets is to, that was also to, like I said, serve as a back brace and also to help with if anybody had spinal issues, people were very often um, issued with special corsets and, some, and that's still something that's practiced today. So I hope you enjoyed this first episode of The Hidden Library and I look forward to having you in episode two where I will be covering a book by the very, very awesome Claire Ridgway. If you are into Tudor history, you will enjoy this one. 
It is the Anne Boleyn Chronicles book one, and I look forward to bringing it to you. So thank you very much for tuning in, and I will see you next time in episode two.